Welcome to Deloitte's Debris Tax webcast series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Geography Update series and is titled 2022 Japan Tax Reform Proposals Pursuit of Post Pandemic Priorities. My name is David Bickle and I'm a tax partner based in our Tokyo office and I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. I have four speakers with me today Brian Douglas, Ken Leong, Brian Mayer and Fumiko Mizuguchi. Mizuguchi-san leads Deloitte's indirect tax practice here in Japan, which of course covers Japanese consumption tax, or JCT. And those of you who have worked with Mizuguchi-san before will also know her as a Steuerberater, or licensed German tax accountant, which also gives her deep expertise in European VAT as well. In addition to Mizuguchi-san, I am delighted to say that my other three colleagues here today work with me in our business tax services group. Ken is a partner specializing in corporation tax matters and Brian Douglas and Brian Mayer are managing director and senior manager respectively. And all of them are based with me here in Japan and when not working from home, uh, we're all located in our Tokyo office. For further details, you can access our bios on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console. Firstly, all users are on listen-only mode. So if you have any content-related questions, you can submit these at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand side of the screen, and we'll do our best to respond to these questions during the course of today's presentation. Secondly, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at their convenience during the webcast. And you may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go to the Downloads and Links box. Alternatively, if you are on the move and are viewing from a mobile device, you can also see all of today's slides on screen and also reply to the survey questions as well. And thirdly and finally, if you require an attendance record for this event, you can download your CPE certificate by clicking the Request CPE icon at the bottom of the webcast console. Okay, so let's now turn to the theme of today's event and the topics we are going to cover. As a reminder, the title of this webinar is 2022 Japan Tax Reform Proposals, the Pursuit of Post-Pandemic Priorities. And in terms of understanding these priorities, I think it's helpful to look back to see how the drivers of Japanese tax policy have been evolving. Over the last four or five years, the content of the annual Japanese tax reform has been driven by the policies of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, in particular measures reflecting his growth strategy, which together with fiscal stimulus and aggressive monetary policy made up the three arrows of his signature approach to rejuvenating the Japanese economy, which was commonly referred to in the media as Abenomics. Um, Prime Minister Abe stood down in September of 2020 and was replaced by his former Chief Cabinet Secretary, Yoshihide Suga. Now, although the Suga administration did not deviate significantly from Abenomics, last year's tax reform certainly reflected Prime Minister Suga's own policy priorities which was shaped in part by the experience of COVID-19 and an increasing focus on climate change. In particular, this manifested itself in the desire to have more resilient systems of business operation and a Japanese economy that could grow sustainably into the future. In less than one year, though, Prime Minister Suga indicated his intention to resign, uh, which uh, led the ruling Liberal Democratic Party to appoint Fumio Kishida, as its new leader and prime minister, and that was in October last year. Now, policy priorities for Prime Minister Kishida continue to focus on the recovery from COVID-19, and the 2022 tax reform proposals announced last December came with the stated goals of contributing to a positive cycle of growth and distribution, uh, wealth distribution in Japan, and also to the development of a new society after COVID-19. So this has led them to proposals to enhance uh, tax incentives for wage increases in the hope of pushing more money into the pockets of Japanese consumers, uh, 
and also special transitional arrangements for the electronic preservation of documents in connection with the drive to digital transformation. And we'll be looking at both of these today, and we'll also be covering tax reform proposals for changes to the rules on the withholding of income tax on certain dividends. And as we do that, we're going to take this as an opportunity to recap on some of the issues that foreign investors into Japan typically want to understand and address in connection with the repatriation of profits. And lastly, although we uh, may change the order around a bit here, we'll also take a look at the developments in connection with what is one of the biggest changes on the horizon for taxpayers in Japan, which will be the implementation next year of qualified invoicing for consumption tax purposes, so Japanese indirect tax purposes. So um, without further ado, Ken, uh, if you're there, I'd like to hand over to you, please, to take us through the latest incarnation of Japan's salary tax credit. Thanks, David, and good afternoon to all. Before jumping into the details of the changes to the salary tax credit, it might be useful to first provide some context. Annual real salaries in Japan have increased by only 4% in the past 30 years. Over the same period, US salaries jumped by roughly half, and the OECD average rose by a third. Successive governments have attempted to tackle the problem of stagnant wages and their deflationary effect. In recent years, the third arrow of Prime Minister Abe's so-called Abenomics, as mentioned by David, aimed to promote growth strategies to stimulate private sector investments with the overall goal of overcoming deflation. This policy has been continued by the governments of Prime Minister Suga and current Prime Minister Kishida, who has stated a goal of a virtuous cycle of growth and distribution aimed at boosting private sector investments and disposable income. The salary tax credit is one tool by which companies are encouraged to increase their employee salaries. In recent years, the qualifying conditions for the credit have been amended, with each revision reflecting the incumbent administration's economic policies. If we look at this slide, we can see that for fiscal years beginning on or before 31 March 2021, Eligibility for the salary tax credit was linked to the amount of the company's domestic capital investment, reflecting investment in Japan policy. Just for years beginning on or after 1 April 2021, the domestic capital investment requirement was abolished, and a new condition for increased salaries to newly hired employees was introduced, reflecting a policy of replacing jobs that were lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With this background in mind, Let's now look at the proposed changes to the salary tax credit in this year's tax reform. The tax credit is calculated differently for large companies and small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs, and I'll start with the changes for large companies. For the purposes of the salary tax credit, a large company is in principle a company with paid-in capital of more than 100 million yen. However, a company with paid-in capital of 100 million yen or less is treated as a large company if at least 50% of its shares are owned by a large company, at least two-thirds of its shares are held by two or more large companies, or its annual average income exceeds 1.5 billion yen. A company which is not a large company is by default treated as an SME. There are two key changes proposed as indicated at the right of this slide. First, the main qualifying condition will be revised from newly hired employees back to continuously employed people. This is most likely a recognition by the government that as the COVID-19 pandemic drags on, companies are unlikely to increase headcount, so the current employee salary tax credit offers no incentive to increase employee salaries. Second, the available tax credit rates will be expanded from 15% or 20% under the current tax law to a maximum of 25% or 30% depending upon the percentage increase in the company's salaries and education and training costs. Mm. Thanks, Ken. And the, the salary tax credit, I think, is a good example of how tax laws are used to implement government policies. Um, is there any guidance with regard to the meaning of continuously employed people? Yes, there is, David. The draft tax reform states that continuously employed people are employees who have received salary in all months during the current year and the previous year, subject to certain conditions. These conditions are not explained in detail in the draft tax reform, 
but are likely to include persons registered for employment insurance, meaning they are listed in a wage ledger prescribed by the Labor Standards Act. We'll need to wait until the relevant regulations are issued for further details. Mm-hmm. And I understand there's an additional requirement for companies with paid in capital of 1 billion yen or more, and also at least 1,000 employees. Yes, there is. These companies will need to notify the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, or METI, that they've made a public announcement regarding the policy for increasing salaries and other matters. Thanks, Ken. Okay, well, it looks like an example of the government using the tax law to promote the effectiveness of its policies. Um, Turning now, then, to salary tax credits for SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Um, Could you take us through the proposed changes there, please? Yes. As a reminder, SME is a company other than a large company. Under the current tax law, the tax credit is either 15% or 25% of the salary increase amount. In order to qualify for the 25% tax credit rate, a company must also meet the education and training costs requirement, as indicated at the left of this slide. This requirement can be satisfied in two ways. First, the company has increased its education and training costs by 10% from the previous year. Or the company has submitted a business plan for improvement of management capability, approved by the relevant ministry under the Small and Medium-Sized Enterprise Business Enhancement Act by the end of the fiscal year, and the company must have achieved a certified improvement in management capability in accordance with this plan. Under the revised tax law, there are two key changes, as indicated at the right of this slide. First, the option to satisfy the education and training cost requirement by submission of a business plan for improvement of management capability will be abolished, which acts as an incentive for SMEs to invest in their employees. Second, the available tax tax credit rates will be expanded from 15% or 25% under the current tax law to a maximum of 30% or 40% depending upon the percentage increase in the company's salaries and education and training costs. Thanks for that, Ken. And, you know, as is often the case with tax reforms, uh, with every carrot, there tends to be a stick. So (laughs) does this hold true for the revisions to the employee salary tax credit? Yes, it does, David. But in this case, the stick is a short one. As part of the 2018 tax reform, rules were introduced to prevent a large company from claiming certain tax credits if its current year income exceeds its prior year income and it either did not increase its salaries from the prior fiscal year or did not make a specified level of domestic capital investment. The tax credits disallowed are highlighted at the bottom of this slide and include the R&D tax credit. The application period of these rules was extended by last year's tax reform to 31 March 2024. In this year's tax reform, Condition 1 will be tightened, but only for large companies with paid in capital of 1 billion yen or more, at least 1,000 employees, and income above zero in the prior, prior fiscal year. So this is what I mean by the stick being short. The revision is essentially aimed at the very large companies which have not increased their salaries or domestic capital investment despite a growth in their income. This will be achieved by requiring a specific growth percentage in salaries, 0.5% until 31 March 2023 and 1% until 31 March 2024 and essentially acts as a measure to ensure that as the very largest companies grow, their employees are not left behind in terms of real wage growth. Back to you, David. Thanks very much for that, Ken. Okay, so uh, moving away from incentives, I'd like us to Uh, take a look now at an issue that was occupying a lot of taxpayers in Japan in the run-up to the end of last year, the end of 2021, in connection with the electronic storage of documents and records. Now, this focus on electronic storage is very much in line with the government's push that I mentioned earlier for digital transformation, and minds were focused on a 31st of December implementation deadline. So that was 31st of December last year, 2021. Um, Brian Mayer, uh, if I could bring you in here, please. I think um, I think taxpayers were in varying states of readiness at the end of last year, but the tax reform may now have provided a little bit of breathing space. Um, could you update us on what's happened, please? 
Sure, David. Uh, and as many of you may be aware from the 2021 tax reforms, uh, Japan made certain amendments to its rules on document retention, and in particular uh, is making a push for companies to keep records digitally under Japan's Electronic Record Retention Law, or the ERRL, as we'll refer to it today. And so after assessing the situation over the course of 2021, uh, the government has now announced some transitional measures in its most recent tax reform, and these may provide some relief uh, for taxpayers who are still trying to transition to the new rules. Uh, but before getting into the details, and as a brief refresher uh, for everyone on the call today, the ERRL basically covers four different types of documents which can be maintained digitally uh, for tax purposes. And so from left to right uh, on screen here, uh, these would include your accounting books. So this would be your general ledgers, your journals. And then on the right side here, these three broad categories of records which are kept for tax purposes, including uh, internally generated documents, such as your financial statements. Uh, this would include paper documents you've received from counterparties, uh, which you may have stored, uh, scanned and stored electronically. And then finally, on the far right, highlighted in red here, we have these electronic transaction records, uh, which refers to transactional type documents, such as invoices or contracts, uh, which have been exchanged in a digital format. So in particular, uh, one of the major changes in last year's reform was the requirement to keep these uh, electronic transaction records in a digital format, uh, essentially meaning they could no longer be printed out and saved in hard copy. And, and this new rule has, in principle, been in effect from the 1st of January of this year. Uh, Brian, if I can just interrupt you for a second there. Um, given we are already in March now, and in principle these rules have been in effect since the 1st of January, uh, where do we see companies in terms of compliance right now? And you know, how do these transitional measures you mentioned come into play? Yeah, certainly, David. Those are good questions. And to be honest, we see a lot of companies, particularly in the inbound space, who are still making efforts to become compliant with the ERRL. And we've had discussions uh, with certain companies who are looking to uh, modify their internal systems or implement uh, policies uh, in order to meet these specific integrity and visibility components of the requirements for uh, electronic transaction records. And as for the transitional measures, which you mentioned, these were included in the 2022 tax reform and apply specifically to cases where electronic transaction records are still not being maintained by a taxpayer digitally in line with the ERRL as of 1st January. And these measures essentially offer a grace period of two years for taxpayers to become compliant with their electronic transaction records. And in order to be eligible for this grace period, companies would need to meet uh, two conditions. First, uh, the tax office would need to determine that there are unavoidable circumstances which prevent the taxpayer from saving the records electronically in line with the ERRL. And secondly, uh, if requested by the tax office, uh, these records could be provided uh, to the tax officer in paper copy. And it's also noteworthy that taxpayers are not required to file any formal application in order to utilize this grace period, uh, but each company's specific situation would be assessed by the tax office uh, in the context of a tax audit, for example. And I note that you referred to so-called unavoidable circumstances which prevent the taxpayer from being compliant. Um, do we have any idea what the tax authority might consider to be a so-called unavoidable circumstance? Sure. And this is a question we've gotten from a number of companies, and it's certainly been a topic of discussion. So back in December, after the tax reforms were announced, uh, the NTA released some updated guidance on how this grace period would be applied. And one of the key takeaways from this guidance was it seems that the tax authority intends for a quote unquote unavoidable circumstance to be more broadly interpreted and would include, for example, uh, cases where a company hasn't 
yet achieved compliance with their records due to not completing necessary updates to their systems or perhaps not finalizing their internal workflows uh, as of 1st January. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no requirement to file any application to uh, apply this grace period, but if asked by the tax authority, a taxpayer should be able to explain uh, their situation, why they're not yet compliant, and explain their plan for becoming compliant uh, in the future. Mm, I see. Uh, given this rather broad interpretation, it seems that the grace period offers a bit of an opportunity for companies still trying to catch up. Um, and do we have any insights on what companies should be focusing on during this period in order to ensure that they do get compliant by the end of it? Sure. And given there's some additional time offered here by this grace period, I think it might be helpful to show some examples of how companies can successfully maintain uh, transaction records digitally and highlight some of the methods we're seeing put to use by some of our inbound clients. And as you may recall from the first slide I talked to, there's two broad requirements to meet when saving digital transaction records. Uh, the first dealing with the integrity of the document by essentially preventing any corrections or deletions to the contents. And the second dealing with the visibility of the document uh, by being able to search it and retrieve it within your system. So as for the integrity requirement, companies can either meet this requirement uh, by using uh, ERL compatible systems, which we see at the top here, uh, or through the use of authorized timestamps is another way, or uh, as we see at the bottom, by creating an internal set of policies regarding corrections or deletions to the documents. And as the requirements of the ERRL are quite specific, we often find that use of ERRL compatible systems or say the use of authorized timestamps uh, can actually require a substantial investment of both time and resources. So while it may make sense for a Japan headquartered company to invest in these changes long term uh, in order to be compliant, it's not always feasible for a foreign headquartered company to implement these system-wide changes for rules that would only be applicable in Japan, right? So for this reason, uh, we're seeing a number of our inbound clients focusing on updating their internal policies. Uh, so at the bottom we see here as a way to satisfy the requirements of the ERRL in Japan. And as for the visibility requirements and specifically the search function, in practice we see companies uh, who are checking their existing accounting systems or SAP as to whether it can meet the standards of an acceptable search function. Um, and in the case of smaller scale companies, it's also possible to create a bit of a manual workaround by simply listing up their electronic records in Excel, uh, which has the search function capabilities to be compliant. Uh, but to close out uh, here, I think the main takeaway um, is this two-year grace period does provide some relief in the timing for getting compliant, uh, but companies should also consider how much effort is required for their specific situation and then decide how to proceed accordingly. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to you, David. Thanks very much for that, Brian. And to wrap up on this topic, if I may, um, I'd like to invite our audience to share their responses to a polling question. And the polling question is, to what extent is your business compliant with the rules for keeping digital records under Japan's electronic record retention law, the ERRL? And the response options are as follows. Firstly, we're definitely compliant, uh, meaning that we understand the requirements and have validated our system functionality. Secondly, uh, should be compliant but we have some gaps in our knowledge of the rules and or our IT system functionality. Uh, third option is not compliant, where we do not know the, well, sorry, where we know the requirements, but have identified gaps in system functionality. And finally, number four, do not know, either unsure about the requirements uh, or unsure about the IT system functionality as well. Okay, so 
while we wait a few moments for the results to come in, I'd like to um, bring you in here, please, Ms. Uh We're going to talk in a few minutes about one of the biggest changes currently on the horizon for Japanese tax compliance, which, as I mentioned before, is the introduction of so-called qualified invoicing for Japanese consumption tax purposes. Um, and although this raises a number of non-tax issues for taxpayers to be aware of, you know, the fundamental trigger is, of course, a change in a documentation requirement relating specifically to invoices, and which we saw from Brian's first slide a few minutes ago, is covered by the ERRL. So without jumping ahead to the new rules on the format of qualified invoices, could you just remind us, please, on um, you know, the rules of how, how the rules on electronic record retention are relevant to JCT compliance? For example, what could happen from a JCT perspective if companies do not store their invoices in line with these ERRL rules? Thanks, David. Yes, um, the consequence would be um, that the input JCT deduction would be denied um, if the incoming invoices will not be stored in line with the ERR uh, rules. But in order to avoid this uh, negative consequence, actually, um, only for JCT purposes, it is still allowed to store um, invoices uh, also paper base, but you know um, if this is uh, so uh, wished by the company, it's, I, I don't know. Okay, well, certainly an issue for uh, all taxpayers, uh, well, JCT taxpayers, uh, to be aware of not just the changes to the qualified invoicing rules, but also these changes in the ERRL. Um, Brian, I hope you're still around. Uh, we've got the results have come in. Um, any observations from your perspective on these? Yeah, David, and to be honest, it's not too surprising. Um, a lot of our inbound companies are already saving documents uh, digitally, so uh, that's not necessarily an issue, but there may be some gaps uh, between how they're doing so and uh, the ERRL. So I think, as I mentioned, this two-year grace period is a good time to uh, check and ensure uh, that you're uh, going to be compliant uh, in the near future. And interesting, I think, uh, you know, with one third of people not knowing, this is a, an unknown unknown here. So. Okay, um, thanks very much for that, uh, Brian. Okay, so Mr. Goodsan, uh, let's come back now to JCT proper and uh, the topic of qualified um, invoicing, which although not part of the 2022 tax reform, is certainly one of the key Japan issues that is occupying uh, tax directors and CFOs at the moment. We're going to spend a bit of time looking at what will be unique about qualified invoicing, but before we get into that, can you just quickly recap for us, please, on you know, the background, uh, the rules in general? Well, the government has decided to introduce from October 1st, 2023, the so-called qualified invoice system, which shares similarities with the European VAT invoice system. But nevertheless, there are also quite a few differences between the two. Mainly, for the purpose of the input JCT deduction, after the introduction of QI, the qualified invoice system, the taxpayers need to retain qualified invoices. That is the main objective of this new system. And also, notably, and there are tax exempt businesses in Japan which currently charge JCT but they will not be eligible to register as qualified invoice issuers. So they would not be able to issue any qualified invoices after the introduction of the qualified invoice system, which means that the purchasers principally will not be allowed to deduct the deemed input JCT charged by the tax exempt businesses anymore. Mm. Thanks for that. And just to clarify, when we say tax exempt businesses, we're talking here about businesses which supply goods and services that under JCT law are subject to Japanese consumption tax. But it's the, the small size of the business means that they are not obliged to report JCT by filing a JCT return or to remit JCT to the Japanese tax authorities. Is, 
Is that a correct summary? Yes, that's right. And the point is that in order to be able to issue QI, businesses must first register for that purpose with the tax authorities. But if you are a JCT exempt business, you are not eligible to register, so you will not be able to issue QI. Okay, and that's going to be an important point then for businesses to figure out if they have such exempt businesses in their supply chain, as that could affect their ability to deduct input JCT going forward, which could then have an impact on their JCT cash tax liability. Um, before diving deeper into that, though, I think it's worth stepping back for a moment for the benefit of an inbound audience. Um, Foreign parented groups that have a business in Japan will likely have some existing experience with other indirect tax regimes around the world, including European VAT. And when they look at the JCT reforms, I think expectations for some at least are shaped by what they already know of European VAT. So with that in mind, can you, you just take us through some of the unique features uh, about the new qualified invoicing system that might be different to say, uh, VAT in Europe? Sure, David. And there are three differences that I think we can touch on today. The first difference is that there are fewer required items compared to European VAT invoices. And if you look up here, the items to be shown in the invoice according to Article 226 of the EU VAT Directive, there are so many items to be shown Actually, even after the introduction of QI, qualified invoices need to contain only these, let's say, six items. The name and ID of the, the issuer are still required, but the addresses and also customer ID are not requested. Date of supply, quantity and nature of goods and services, taxable amount per rate, density tax rate, and JCT amount payable, that's it. So the contents of the invoice are quite simple, even after the introduction of QI. The, the second difference relates to rounding, and this is quite an important issue for JCT. It's different from the European VAT system and the indirect tax system of many other major jurisdictions Normally, inbound investors with experience of foreign indirect tax systems think that JCT can be calculated line by line, meaning that the, the tax amount would be rounded on a line by line basis. But JCT law requires the taxpayer to round their tax amount only once on the invoice level. And as shown here, that makes a difference in the tax amount. Mm -hmm. So looking at the example in this slide, on the left-hand side, we see line by line rounding uh, and each item priced at 1,024 yen being taxed at 10% JCT gives JCT of 102.4. And that fraction of 0.4 is then rounded down to just 102. And we're saying that that is incorrect for JCT purposes? Yes, exactly. If you add up those line-by-line -line totals, which have been rounded down, the total JCT liability is shown as 408. Conversely, as shown on the right-hand side, where the pre-tax total of 4,096 yen is rounded only once, the 10% JCT liability is 409.6, which is rounded to 410. So a company that is calculating tax and rounding on a line-by-line -line basis would be underpaying JCT, meaning 408 versus the correct amount of 410. That's a small amount to illustrate to point, the point, but um, over hundreds of thousands or even millions of transactions, the difference between the amount of JCT the company is paying and the amount of JCT it should be paying could become quite material. As a result, companies 
that are calculating JCT on a line-by-line -line basis either need to make adjustments to ensure they pay the correct amount of tax or change their ERP system to calculate tax amounts on an invoice total basis rather than a line-by-line -line basis. Mm. And I think that's a great example of what we mean when we say that although it's a tax law change, which is the trigger for qualified invoicing, it's going to be teams like accounting, IT, and in-house legal who are going to need to sit up, take notice, and address the impact of these changes. Okay, so that's two differences between JCT, qualified invoicing, and European VAT. Uh, what about the third one you mentioned? The third difference relates to the treatment of invoices received from tax-exempt businesses. Uh, and, and, sorry, that was uh, what we touched on at the beginning in relation to small exempt businesses not being eligible to issue qualified invoices. Yes, that's right. And the first point to note for tax exempt businesses is that under QI, they will not be able to issue qualified invoices. Consequently, the purchaser will not be able to deduct input JCT, which will increase your purchase costs. The second point to note is that there are quite a few of these tax exempt businesses in Japan, about 2.3 million in fact which are currently charging JCT to their customers. At the moment, businesses which are JCT taxpayers and which are purchasing these goods and services are entitled to take a deduction for input tax on these purchases. After the introduction of QI in October 2023, however, these purchases will in principle no longer be able to take an input JCT deduction on these invoices from exempt suppliers. Hmm. So I, I guess it's less attractive then to purchase from these small businesses if it won't be possible to take an input tax deduction. Exactly. And for that reason, there has been a lot of political lobbying, which has resulted in a long six-year period of transitional measures that will, the politicians hope, allow some time for the small exempt businesses to adjust without losing their customers. Mm. And how are those transitional measures going to work? Well, for the first three years under the QI system, purchasers will still be able to deduct 80% of the deemed input JCT charged by small exempt businesses, and 50% for the next three years after that. Okay, moving on. What does it mean financially when it will no longer be possible to deduct deemed input JCT on purchases charged by exempt businesses? In this table, we use some simple numbers to illustrate the impact for a buyer, which makes purchases from an exempt business, referred to here as a seller, first under current rules and second under the QR system after the end of the six-year transitional period. So looking at the top half of the table, which shows the current situation before the introduction of the QI system, you can see that the tax exempt seller purchases goods for 8,800 yen and sells them to the buyer for 11,000 yen. And the seller makes a profit of 2,200 2, yen. At the same time, seller does not pay any JCT to the tax authority. Yeah. And just so we can follow the numbers on the table, we're reading across the rows here in the top half of uh, this slide, yeah? Yes, that's right, top half. Looking across the first row, left to right, to see position of the seller, and then left to right across second row for position of the buyer. So looking at the second line, you as a buyer purchased the goods for 11,000 Japanese yen, inclusive of JCT, 
and from your perspective, you treat 10% of 11,000 yen or 1,000 yen as input JCT. And, and that's what we mean by the deemed input JCT? Yes, indeed. Even though the seller is not levying JCT because it's an exempt entity, you as a buyer are still making a purchase of a taxable supply. So you can deem that purchase price to be inclusive of JCT. When it comes to you as buyer selling that same product you do so for 13,200 yen. That means a unit price of 12,000 yen because you would have levied 10% JCT, meaning 1,200 yen yourself on that amount to arrive at the JCT inclusive price of 13,200 yen. Even though you purchase the goods from the exempt business, you could still deduct 1,000 yen as input JCT, so you only have to remit 200 yen to the tax authority. That is the situation under current rules. After the introduction of the, the QI system, though, and we are looking at the lower half of the table now, there is no change for the seller. But for the buyer, though, you purchase goods again for 11,000 yen, but you will no longer be able to deduct 1,000 yen as deemed input JCT. And this means you will have to pay 1,200 yen as output JCT to the tax authority. So you see a previously deductible 1,000 yen deemed input JCT has vanished. And that hits your profit which has now been reduced from 2,000 yen to 1,000. In summary then, where you have suppliers that are tax exempt businesses and which are not able to issue QI, your cost of sales as purchaser would increase by 2% from October 2023, by 5% October 2026, and finally 10% after October 2029. Thanks very much for that, Mr. Gujisan. Um, I think this is a good place to uh, wrap up our coverage of JCT qualified invoicing. But just before uh, before we do, I think it would be helpful to uh, sense check whether the adverse financial impact just described will be a significant issue for inbound businesses. Well, the short answer is that it is impossible to say without a particular business screening its supply chain to understand whether it's making significant purchases from JCT exempt suppliers. Just to put things in a final perspective though, I think it's worth, to, worth remembering that in Japan there are 6 million businesses out of which around 40% are JCT tax exempt businesses. Therefore, there is statistically at least a reasonable chance that you might be being supplied by tax exempt businesses. Currently, these 6 million businesses are all charging JCT, but after the introduction of QI system, you will not be able to deduct any input JCT on purchases from exempt businesses once the six year transitional period is over. Mm. And I think that's a good message to end on, highlighting the importance of collaborating with other functions in your organization outside of finance, perhaps um, in-house legal counsel, in order to effectively screen through your suppliers uh, in good time before the rules come in. Okay, thank you, Ms. Agudisan. And I'd like now to pivot back to the 2022 tax reform and ask Brian D, uh, Brian Douglas, to explain about changes to the taxation of dividend distributions. In doing so, uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to take this opportunity, as I said before, to provide a little bit of context and highlight more broadly some of the considerations for making a distribution from Japan. So with that, Brian, over to you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, David. So uh, we're holding this discussion around two distributions, uh, domestic distribution, uh, between two Japanese entities, 
and an outbound distribution, a distribution from a Japan entity to a foreign entity. And, and I would say there are three important issues to consider when making a distribution, and those are, you know, what are the distributable reserves of the distributing entity? From what source is the distribution being made? And what are the tax implications, both from a withholding tax and corporate income tax perspective? So what are distributable reserves? Well, they're the maximum amount of funds that a company can distribute and largely consist of the retained earnings and what we refer to as other capital surplus, plus or minus some adjustments. Um, so even if a company has excess cash, a distribution can be made only to the extent of the distributable reserve amount. And Brian, are distributable reserves, as we are using the term here, something that is calculated for tax purposes? No, the determination of distributable reserves is actually provided for under the company law, not the tax law. So it's more of a legal matter and would require legal counsel to advise on how to calculate it uh, precisely. Um, the second important thing, uh, as I mentioned, is the source of the distribution. From a tax perspective, the source of the distribution, whether it's from retained earnings or other capital surplus, is important as the tax implications will vary depending on the source. A distribution out of retained earnings is treated as a dividend. A distribution out of other capital surplus may be treated as a deemed dividend or a return of capital, which is treated somewhat like a you know, deemed sale of shares that can result in capital gain or loss at the level of the shareholder. Now, the withholding tax and corporate tax implications will vary depending on how the distribution is treated for tax purposes, and whether it's a domestic or an outbound uh, distribution. And we'll take a look at these on the next couple of slides. Um, but just one thing to point out on, on this slide is that Japan has the concept of a dividends received deduction, which allows a full or a partial exemption of dividend income recognized by the shareholder for corporate income tax purposes. And, and as you can see on the chart, the amount of the exemption depends on the ownership percentage. And before going to the next slide, uh, just going back to distributable reserves, you mentioned that a company that has excess cash can only make a distribution up to its distributable reserve amount. Uh, what if the opposite is true, though? For example, you know, the company has sufficient distributable reserves, but not enough cash to pay out a dividend. Yeah, I think that depends on what the company, you know, wants to do. They have a couple of options. Uh, you know, it can simply distribute out the cash it has on has on hand. Um, it can make a distribution in kind, meaning distribute other properties such as a, a note receivable or maybe shares in another entity. Um, it could also declare a distribution up to the distributable reserve amount and simply owe its shareholder cash to be paid at a later date. And in each of these will have you know, implications in addition to what we'll talk about on the next few slides. Uh, for example, a distribution in kind of appreciated property might trigger a uh, gain to be recognized and taxed in Japan. So let's take a closer look at the tax implications of a domestic distribution. So first, withholding tax implications. Um, uh, withholding tax of 20.42% will be imposed on a domestic distribution uh, to the extent they're treated as a dividend or a deemed dividend. Now, this should really be looked at like a prepayment as the receiving entity, uh, J sub 1, uh, in our case, can claim this withholding tax paid against its corporate tax liability when it files a corporate tax return. Yeah, and if I understand correctly, in the end, there is zero taxation of this dividend, assuming J sub 1 gets a full deduction from corporate tax under the dividend received deduction rules, but J sub one will not have access to about 20% of the dividend until it files its corporate tax return? Yeah, that's right, you're correct, uh, David. Um, and this can be a bit of a cash flow issue for, for some companies, uh, especially companies who want to distribute a significant amount of funds uh, from J sub two all the way up to the foreign parent. Uh, luckily, however, the 2022 tax reform will change this with respect to companies that are entitled to 100% dividends received deduction. Uh, basically, there will be no withholding tax on domestic dividends or deemed dividends on or after the 1st of October 2023. 
Now looking at outbound distributions, I will uh, discuss this you know, based on the source of the distribution. Uh, if the distribution is made out of retained earnings, it will be treated as a dividend subject to withholding tax of 20.42%. But that withholding tax may be reduced or exempt under an applicable tax treaty, uh, provided treaty forms are filed prior to the distribution. Uh, there shouldn't be any corporate tax on the dividend received by foreign parents, provided no PE in Japan. Uh, so withholding tax would represent a final tax if imposed. And just real quick, are the treaty forms that you just mentioned, are they something that requires a lot of time and effort to prepare? Uh, they don't usually take uh, too much time uh, to prepare, although there are some exceptions to this, such as in cases where there might be complex ownership structures or in the case the recipient is fiscally transparent. Um, what may take some time is actually confirming that the recipient is eligible for the treaty benefits and that all the conditions of the treaty are satisfied. Now, if the distribution is made out of other capital surplus, you know, depending on the attributes of the distributing entity, uh, the distribution may be treated uh, in part as a deemed dividend and in part as a deemed sale of shares. So the deemed dividend portion will be treated the same as the dividend I just discussed. The deemed sale of shares portion, however, is a little bit different. Um, while there's no withholding tax uh, imposed on that portion, uh, corporate tax uh, is imposed in cases where the deemed sale of share amount exceeds the tax book value the foreign parent holds in J sub 1, and a corporate tax return uh, would be required to be filed. However, capital gains might be exempt under an applicable treaty, and treaty forms uh, may need to be filed depending on the specific treaty. Mm. And, you know, I don't see many foreign companies filing a corporate tax return to report capital gains in the case of distributions out of capital surplus. Um, I'm wondering, is, is that your experience as well? And if so, is it simply that a treaty can apply in most cases? Yeah, I, I also don't uh, see this often, and it could be due to a variety of uh, reasons. Um, first, you know, while we haven't discussed this, there are certain de minimis rules uh, in Japan, so it's possible that the transaction did not surpass those uh, de minimis amounts. Uh, second, uh, it's possible, especially if a foreign parent incorporated uh, J sub 1, uh, that there is no gain and therefore no tax liability to report. And, and lastly, most treaties with Japan will exempt the gain on the sale of shares, other than shares of uh, companies that are considered real estate rich. Now, just going back to the distributable reserve discussion, um, as we often get asked questions whether there's anything a company can do to increase distributable reserves. And the answer is usually it depends on the specific circumstances and attributes of the company. And I'll give two examples of how companies uh, with certain attributes can increase distributable reserves. The first relates to reducing uh, stated capital or more like reallocating a portion of the state of capital to other capital surplus. So if a company has a significant amount of state of capital, it can undertake certain legal procedures to allocate some of that state of capital to other capital surplus, thereby expanding its distributable reserve amount. Hmm. Seems uh, simple enough. Um, is there any downside, though, or anything companies should be aware of before reducing state of capital? Yeah, whether, whether there's a downside really depends, but there are certainly things to be aware of. Uh, for example, from a tax perspective, the reduction of stated capital to uh, 100 million yen or below will change the way a company is taxed from a local uh, tax perspective and often subjects the company to different regimes or certain incentives. Um, also, while I can't speak to all the details, I, I do recall an instance where a company wanted to reduce its stated capital uh, but doing so would treat the company as a small business under certain company laws in Japan. And that would subject their customers and vendors to more strict rules when doing business with the company. Uh, so in the end, you know, the issues uh, that would have caused their business relationships um, was not worth the tax or the distributable reserve benefit that they might have gotten. Now, the next example does not uh, create um, distributable reserves, but it's a way to include recent earnings in the distributable reserve calculation. 
So in general, distributable reserves are determined based on financials at the end of the fiscal year. So if, for example, a company had no distributable reserves at the end of year one, but had significant earnings and cash at the beginning of year two, you know, maybe it sold a significant asset and it wanted to distribute that cash, well, none of those earnings would be incorporated into the distributable reserve amount until the end of year two. So no cash could actually be distributed until after the end of year two. However, a company can decide to close its book at any time during the year uh, to solidify those earnings generated up to the closing as part of the distributable reserve amount and then make a distribution during the year based on the new distributable reserve amount. And I assume there's a formal process the company may need to execute to close its books during the year? Yeah, there is a legal process, so uh, Japanese legal counsel should be involved. Um, but based on what I've seen, this uh, usually involves doing you know, normal procedures a company would undertake when it closes books at the end of the year, uh, including creating financial statements and having them approved uh, in a shareholders meeting. Um, so those are just uh, two examples of uh, uh, increasing distributable reserves. Um, and I think that covers everything um, I wanted to discuss about distributions in Japan. So I'll turn it back over to you, David. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. And well, that brings us to the end of today's discussion. Um, I think we've now got just a couple of minutes uh, to respond to some of the questions we've had in from the, the audience. Um, and Brian, whilst uh, uh, distributions is, sorry, Brian Douglas, whilst distributions are still fresh in our minds, um, one question here is, um, doesn't distributing out of capital reduce your debt to equity ratio? Um, any comment on that? Yes, uh, um, I, I think um, what the uh, participant is referring to is maybe Japanese thin capitalization rules, which has a safe harbor of uh, a three to one debt equity ratio. So, so yes, um, by distributing out of capital, or in fact, by distributing out of earnings also, uh, this will increase the debt equity ratio. So, so companies that are highly leveraged with the debt uh, will need to pay attention to how uh, a distribution might impact their uh, debt equity ratio for thin cap purposes. Mm. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. And um, um, just time for one more brief question, I think. Um, Brian Mayer, um, just back on uh, ERRL. Um, one question here is, what is an authorized timestamp, and how do we know if our um, how do we know if our timestamps uh, are effective? Any comment on timestamps? Yeah, sure, David. And this is a common question we get from companies. So, for the purposes of digital record keeping, an authorized timestamp uh, would mean a timestamp issued by a provider which has been accredited by the Japan Data Communications Association, or, or JDAC. And the list of authorized timestamp providers is publicly available uh, on the association's website. Um, but it's also important to note that an authorized timestamp would not include, say, a timestamp on an email or timing of when a document was last saved in, in Word or Excel. So just keep that in mind. OK, uh, thanks very much. Very helpful examples. Um, well, look, that's all, unfortunately, we have time for today. So uh, Brian D, Ken, uh, Brian M, and Mizuguchi san thank you. And special thanks to uh, all of you in our audience today who were able to join us. Before you go, uh, we would like you to encourage you to fill out the short survey that will pop up on your screen momentarily and tell us what you thought about today's program. If you joined us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewing. And if you feel that others would benefit from this webcast, please share it via the share this icon or have them visit the debriefs website where, as I mentioned, the archived version will be available. And with thanks to all those who did submit additional questions today, we will be responding to all of the other ones we didn't address just now uh, during the next couple of weeks. And also, if you think of any other questions or comments later, please feel free to reach out to me or to any of our other speakers today, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you. And please don't forget to tune in to our next scheduled webcast from the Indirect Tax Series, which is on the 3rd of March and is titled 
indirect tax developments on electronically supplied services, ESS, and e-invoicing in Asia-Pacific. So, at last then, from all of us here at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte's Asia-Pacific tax webcast today. Goodbye.